But the Bush-Blair alliance, first to fight in Afghanistan and then to invade Iraq, changed everything. British governments now learn painful lessons about the perils of following our key ally too blindly, too far, despite all their mutual exchanges of flattery. Prime Minister, the entire world salutes you and your gallant people and gallant nation. Yet, contrary to the legend of Margaret Thatcher's cosy relationship with Ronald Reagan, the Falklands War tested the Anglo-American alliance to its limits. In 1982, it was a bitter revelation for the Prime Minister to discover that most of the administration, including the President, wanted to withhold support from Britain. It's a very difficult situation for the United States because we're friends with both of the countries engaged in this dispute. Reagan was told by key advisors that a Falklands war might damage Washington's South American clients. UN Ambassador Jean Kirkpatrick was foremost among those anxious for the welfare of the fascist junta in Buenos Aires. The Argentines, of course, have claimed for 200 years that they own those islands, and the British have claimed that they own those islands. And we have said we have no position on who owns those islands. Now, if the Argentines own the islands, then moving troops into them is not armed aggression. As British troops prepared to make their final push for Port Stanley, Kirkpatrick urged Reagan to make Thatcher hold back from humiliating Argentina on the battlefield. It was Memorial Day, 31st of May, when America commemorates its war dead. After meeting Kirkpatrick, Reagan drove to Arlington Cemetery, where in a characteristically sentimental speech, he recalled World War II's sacrifice and principles at the very moment he was urging Thatcher to abandon both. Winston Churchill said of those he knew in World War II, they seemed to be the only young men who could laugh and fight at the same time. Each died for a cause he considered more important than his own life, to defend values which make up what we call civilization and how they must have wished that no other generation of young men to follow would have to undergo that same experience. On the same day the President Reagan spoke, he personally telephoned Margaret Thatcher on the hotline to urge her to accept a diplomatic compromise rather than inflict outright military defeat on Argentina in the Falklands. His administration believed that such an outcome threatened American interests and its crusade against the left in South America. The Prime Minister rebuffed the President with brutal directness, saying, I have to take them now. I didn't lose some of my best ships and some of my finest lives to leave quietly after a ceasefire without the Argentines withdrawing. This is democracy and our islands, and the very worst thing for democracy would be if we failed now. Here, at a critical moment in our fortunes, was evidence of just how roughly the United States could treat us, exposing the limitations of the so-called special relationship at moments when our two countries' strategic interests diverge. It was amazing luck that the United States Defense Secretary, Caspar Weinberger, was a staunch Anglophile. He, almost single-handed, secured critical weapons, intelligence, and logistical support for the British Falklands war effort. British policymakers learnt their lesson from that experience, that we better fight our future wars with the Americans or not at all. Since 1982, British defence policy has been ever more closely locked into alliances for political advantage and from military necessity. In 2003, Tony Blair's government deployed 46,000 British servicemen in Iraq. It was the last time in history that Britain would own soldiers to send such numbers to war, and the story had no happy ending. <laughs>